The next chapter in American Airlines history, and also in the history of the airline industry, happens in 1980. And what happens then is a shock to American Airlines, and it's also a shock to the industry. Um, and what happens is that President Ronald Reagan, who is no big fan of regulation, uh, pushes through a law, the Shannon Kennedy Act in 1978, that basically uh, makes it makes removes all regulation in the airline industry. Um, that is all regulation that didn't have to do with safety and operations. So instead of having to apply to the government to fly, anybody could fly anywhere they wanted and they could set any price they wanted. The law um, was came went through in 1978 and it went into effect in 1980. And it caused a big problem for American Airlines because they were much less prepared than the other airlines to face the competition. And the reason they were badly prepared had to do with the way uh, they were flying, how they were flying, um, where, or more specifically, where they were flying to and from. Now, what we have here is a diagram um, that shows um, some cities. So you see these red dots here. Um, they are cities. So this is city A, city B, C, D, E, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, remember, American Airlines was originally formed as a... Um, conglomerate of uh, a consolidation of many small airlines and all these small airlines they had a flight from here to there and so on so American Airlines had started with a route network that was very um, very much point to point and you know if you want if you're if you're living in uh, city A and you want to fly to this city down here maybe that's city F you know, you want a direct flight, okay? An American had direct flights between uh, lots of cities. Um, so, and you, you start to see that, you know, if you can fly from city A to all these other cities, um, that's a lot of flights. So you see like this and like this. And then of course from city B, yeah, you can fly to the to everybody to every other city as well. You're looking at something like that. And then from each of the other cities to every other city. And you see we're beginning to uh, get a very complicated network here. Um, you know, maybe not all the cities have direct flights, but most of them do. Um, and we begin to get um, a, a very complicated network. Now, the wonderful thing about a direct flight is that it is direct. But the problem is that, you know, even if there is a direct flight from city A here down to city G down here, uh, there aren't that many people who want to fly there. So perhaps you can only fill up one airplane per day, um, maybe not even every day. So, um, so, but anyway, that was basically what American looked like. They didn't have any big central airport that was theirs. However, their competition um, had that. Delta and United Airlines, which were their biggest competitors, still is, um, they had a completely different route network, a different way of flying. Uh, they flew into uh, one central airport like this and then uh, flew out again so that if you want if you were flying Delta and you wanted to fly from city A to city G you had to fly into the central airport and then you had to fly out um, to this city and this is called a hub and spoke system like um, 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 a bicycle wheel has a hub in the middle and spokes that go out. Now, the advantage of um, a hub and spoke system like this is that if you have a flight from A to the city in the middle here, let's uh, it's called city C. If you fly from A to C, you have a flight. That takes passengers not just 
to sea, but they also take passengers to every other destination that uh, flies out from sea. Um, and when and that means that you know these flights have you know lots more passengers, and that means that you know you could perhaps have three or four or five or six flights per day between A and C, and similarly for the other cities. So even though you don't have any direct flights, you have many more flights that you can offer um, that, that people can use. Um, and it depends, and we'll look at that later, it depends a bit on the airplanes and how things are. But, you know, when you start um, the competition, um, it's much, much better to start with a network that looks like this, like a hub and spoke network than with something that looks like this, because quite a few of these flights are not going to be commercially viable. And American Airlines had a system that looked more like this than like that. Now, their competition um, were, um, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're an airline and you have a central hub like that, what are the characteristics of a good hub? Um, and um, so, you know, a competitive position in the airlines, purely in terms of flying, is, is very hard to get at. And the, and the only sort of sustainable thing in the flying itself is that you have, you dominate a very important airport. Uh, there are only so many air, airplanes that can take off and land from uh, an airport uh, a day. The right to land uh, or take off from an airport is called a slot and slots at popular airports are very expensive and popular airports tend to be two things they tend to be important city centers in themselves but also they tend to be very centrally located so that from that hub you can fly to many places now, when I ask people, what do you think is the biggest airport in the world? Most people will say things like, they'll think of a big city and they'll say, um, how about New York? Maybe Beijing or Shanghai, even bigger, um, or, um, you know, Paris or London. Well, um, as it turns out, the biggest airport here, you know, here you have a list of the biggest airports in the world and at the top, is an airport that most people don't think about. Uh, and that airport is um, Atlanta in, uh, in, uh, in Georgia, in the United States. Now, most people don't think of that as the biggest airport in the world, but it has in fact been the biggest airport in the world for many years, at least 20 years. Um, and um, uh, the reason is that if you look at um, a map of the United States, now, Atlanta is, let's see, I'm not quite sure, but let's say it's somewhere here um, in Georgia. Um, now, Atlanta d doesn't look like a very central place. I mean, you've got big city centers like New York up here, Boston, um, the consulting capital of the world, uh, where, you know, lots of people fly in and out. you got Los Angeles, you got San Francisco. Um, and you know Chicago over here why is Atlanta I mean granted it is a big city uh, why is that so central and the answer is because it is so centrally located in terms of population centers in the United States so here's a map that shows um, where people live in the United States and uh, you know you see people in the United States they live along the coast on one side um, there's a huge concentration of people from basically from north of Boston all the way down to Washington, D.C. There is a big concentration in the south in the so-called research triangle. And then you have Minneapolis, you have Chicago, you have Detroit um, and, and, you know, the, the mid, uh, Midwest right here. But um, and, you know, Houston or Dallas, sorry, Dallas. Um, Houston, San Antonio, places down here. Uh, but you know, so large portions of the United States is actually quite sparsely populated. And if you look at Atlanta, which is here, um, it is actually, um, I'll try to 
do this in red. But if you look at it, if you're flying to Europe, that goes in that direction. If you're flying to Europe, if you're flying to South America, it goes down in that direction. If you're flying um, to the Pacific, to China, you're flying out in that direction. Um, so it's very nicely located to connect all these populated areas. So people flying down from New York, changing their plane in Atlanta, and flying perhaps to here or to here. So that's why Atlanta is, is the biggest airport in the world. It's both a big city, but it's also um, a, um, a big, um, um, very centrally located in itself. And that's why it has remained the biggest airport in the world. The rest of the airports, you see Beijing has grown uh, quite dramatically. Los Angeles is very important, both for flying south, but also flying out to, um, the, to the east. Um, um, Tokyo, obviously, Tokyo is the, big, um, the biggest city in Japan. Dubai, Dubai in itself is not that big. But if you look at the Arab countries, Dubai, um, uh, Abu Dhabi, um, and, uh, and uh, oh, I forget, uh, but, you know, um, these uh, Arab countries are building, investing very heavily in, in their airports. And the reason is that they are nicely located between Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, and... and Changing a plane is very easy to do, for instance, in Dubai, which is one reason why it has come so high up. Chicago O'Hare here is also very important because it covers both the east side and um, the west side of the United States. And, um, you know, Heathrow, Shanghai is fairly far down on the list. Uh, and that is mainly because in Shanghai there are two big airports. If they had been put together, they would have been if not the biggest in the world, at least pretty close. Um, Charles de Gaulle, because it's very centrally located in Europe. And then at the 10th, you find Dallas-Fort Worth in uh, the United States. And that is where um, American Airlines is located. In the situation that American Airlines was in, um, they had their main hub um, over here. Um, this... You know, if you're flying from New York to Los Angeles, it's actually a 45-minute detour to fly down to Dallas-Fort Worth. They had a route structure that looked more like this, and they didn't have a big, important airport that they could dominate, like Delta uh, could in, um, in Atlanta, and uh, Chicago, uh, that United could in Chicago. So what were they going to do to make people fly them? and not fly somebody else? Well, the answer lies in the invention of something that we now all take for granted, but which American was the first airline to do, at least the first major airline to do, and that is the Frequent Flyer Club. And the first Frequent Flyer Club of any size was called Advantage, and it was uh, launched by American Airlines. And the reason they launched it is because they, when the competitive, the, the freeing up of the regulation came, they knew that they had to do something to differentiate themselves from other airports. Uh, they were going to change their route network, but that would take time and cost money. And they were, it was very important that people chose to fly with them. And they came up with the Frequent Flyer Club, which was that you earned points or miles. So every time you flew, you would earn a certain number of miles and you could redeem them for flying more. Now, uh, <laughs> when they launched it, people thought they were crazy. They were saying, the people who are going to earn the most miles are people who fly a lot already, like business people. They don't want to fly more in their spare time. Well, it turned out that that was not the case. It turns out that we as human beings are two different people when we fly for business and we fly for pleasure. And getting miles when we fly so that we can take our families flying when we have a holiday turns out to be a very, very nice proposition. 
So when Advantage launched in uh, early 1981, um, they expected to get 25,000 uh, members the first year. That was what they hoped for. It turned out they got 250,000 members in six months. And the important thing was that the members they got were the high flyers, the people who fly a lot. Now, I know people who work as consultants who fly every day of the week around the world. I know, I've known people who, who literally flies around Europe, you know, every day. Um, I have been a consultant like that myself. In 1998, I had 180 flying days. Um, so I was, uh, you know, traveling and traveling and traveling all over the world. Um, and uh, I got some very nice bonuses from some airlines, primarily SAS. And um, um, so basically um, what they attracted was very loyal customers who wanted to fly American because they got something for themselves. And the ones they attracted were the people who were flying the most. And the people that fly a lot are absolutely the most profitable customers you can have because they pay uh, more. It's probably the company that pays for them. They're not price sensitive and they bring a lot of traffic, even though there aren't that many people, of them, um, that, that many of them. So there you got it. This was the third time that American Airlines was saved by using information technology smartly. First, by their reservation system. Second, by being first to spread their reservation system out to travel agents. Third, by inventing the frequent flyer club. But they were smarter than that because as soon as the other airlines saw that this was very advantageous, you know, there was, well, it's called advantage, right? As, as, when they saw that was very advantageous, they also wanted to have their own frequent flyer clubs. But it took them quite a while to reprogram their computers to do it. You needed to have very good systems to be able to do it. So it took United Airlines more than two years to come up with their um, the frequent flyer club, which I think is called Sky Premier. Um, and then other airlines followed and started to develop their systems and, and started to, to develop frequent flyer clubs. But there were also a lot of airlines that didn't have any frequent flyer clubs. And what American Airlines did was to basically take their frequent flyer club software and then go to other airlines that didn't have frequent flyer clubs and say, if you want to run a frequent flyer club, you can pay and, and run, um, you can pay us and we will run it for you. And uh, American Airlines ended up running uh, frequent flyer clubs for more than 50 other airlines. So, and that's a very smart strategic move because if you have, if you're the first to have something, that is a temporary competitive advantage but you manage it as a temporary competitive advantage. And when the competition starts to do the same thing, you can turn around and sell what you do as a service to those who don't have it. Now, every airline has a frequent flyer club and it doesn't matter that much which frequent flyer club you are a member of um, because you know it, it, it's basically the, the airline that is closest to uh, where you live or closest to where you fly the most. Um, but this had enormous competitive impact for American and for certain other airlines, British Airways, um, SAS, Scandinavian Airlines System um, in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, these frequent flyer clubs have turned out to be very, very important for the people that fly the most. So again, how to use information technology to provide differentiation and a competitive advantage. A little side note here. At this point, American Airlines was famous for using information technology smartly um, to, uh, to, to, to gain a competitive advantage. And uh, they, started, uh, they started to get into the business of information technology as a business in itself. So they separated the airline and uh, the systems and they called the airline, of course, was American Airlines and the systems were called Sabre Group. Um, that was about 10,000 people. There were 114,000 people working for the airline. Uh, the uh, parent corporation was called AMR. And um, 
in this situation, uh, Bob Crandall, the CEO, was asked, you know, how valuable is the technology side, the IT side um, of American Airlines? And he said, well, if I have a choice, either I have to sell the airline or I have to sell the IT systems, I'm going to sell the airline um, because the IT systems were so uh, powerful. At this point, American Airlines reservation system, the Sabre, was the largest civilian system in the world. All right. Um, so now you see how you can, you know, um, do gain a competitive advantage, make yourself different by using things like loyalty cards and be the first to do it. All right. Um, the next thing we're moving on to, the next development had to do with pricing. And... Um, you know, airline prices, um, they used to be regulated, so they were fixed. Then people were competing with very um, low prices. Some airlines came in, some startup airlines, low cost, came in and have a fixed low price, $75. Then some other airlines, United and American, found that they could lower the price on some seats so that you know you could see an ad in the newspaper that said new york to london 75 dollars for the low-cost airline and then united and american airlines would say well new york to london 69 dollars of course that was just a few seats but the fact that they had the capability of pricing their seats differently instead of having one fixed price for the whole uh, for every seat in the in the whole airplane meant that they could underbid the low-cost airlines, even though they were a full-cost airline. But pretty soon after that, pricing got much more advanced. But that is the subject for another video.